I don't wanna grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day to the Why did I go into astronomy? Interesting question. So I've been a science nut ever since my earliest memories. In kindergarten and first grade, I was fascinated by magnets and how there was this force I could feel but could not see. And it was clearly different from whatever it is that uh, holds me to Earth because the Earth never pushes away, whereas two like poles of a magnet would repel each other. And I'd play with the magnets in a sandbox and pick up little black stuff, which later turned out to be little bits of iron that are in the quartz crystals. And so that began a long fascination with science, and I played with microscopes and electronic circuits and chemistry sets, and eventually astronomy. But from age 10 through 17, my main interest actually was chemistry. I entered college as a chemistry major, but near the end of my freshman year, switched to physics with the intention of pursuing astrophysics, in part because I took a fascinating introductory astronomy class, which showed me the wonders of the universe, and the fact that you needed to understand the microphysics, the physics on atomic and subatomic scales, in order to understand the entire universe. So by switching to astrophysics, I could have it all, in a sense. The other reason was more of a sense of self-preservation. Like many young chemists, I played with small amounts of explosives, and a couple of times they went off in my face, and I realized that if I continued to have easy access to dangerous chemicals, I would probably lose my eyesight or perhaps even my life. And so I better switch out of chemistry before I do myself some real danger, some real harm. <laughs> so that's it. Wait, wait in the back, yeah. Yes, another eclipse coming up, right. Well, it's an X on the US, in fact. So after 38 years of not having a single total eclipse, we've got one coming up in August of this year, August 21st. And then just seven years later, on April 8th, 2024, there will be one that goes from south to north, going through Mexico, Texas, bunch of states, and it crosses, I believe, in southern Illinois. So there's, some, there's a few towns there that have two in rather quick succession. The typical time you have to wait for an eclipse, a total one, to visit you is 380 years. So they are quite lucky indeed. I think it takes about 5,000 years before you have a 99% chance of having seen a total eclipse. But some places are luckier than others, and a few centuries from now, southern Illinois might not have any, you know. So if you miss this one coming up, yes, there is another uh, chance. So yes? So last year you talked about the gravitational waves of black holes. Ah, the gravitational waves of black holes that I spoke about at Day last year, yes. Any new developments? Well, so the new developments are that the teams have now reported not just one event, but 2.7 events, the 0.7 being a third event in which they have only 70% confidence. But I've examined the data, and the data look quite compelling to me. I think they're being just rather conservative and not making a claim that they can't fully back up as, a, say, a five standard deviation that is nearly certain result. But yeah, so uh, they found some more. They then took the LIGO detectors offline for a while in order to upgrade the sensitivity in order to be able to reach even more distant gravitational wave events like mergers of black holes or uh, more nearby mergers of neutron stars that don't produce such a strong signal. And we should expect to hear more, I think, in the coming year. Yeah. One more question. How about right there? Yes. Habitable, planet near red dwarfs? Habitable planets near red dwarfs. Well, you know, more and more exoplanets are being found, in particular by the Kepler spacecraft that notices the tiny dimming of light that occurs when a planet passes right between its host star and us. And that technique turns out to be sensitive even to Earth-sized planets. And now so many of them are known that a few of them happen to be in the region where at least a back of the envelope simple calculation without knowing atmospheric constituents and all that suggests that the temperature is conducive to the presence of liquid water and thus perhaps to life as we know it. So there's one, one more question right here. Yes, and then we'll start. This is at one moon of Saturn. 
a moon of Saturn. Yeah, yeah, Enceladus has these southern pole tiger stripes, they're called, which are fissures in the icy crust that reach pretty deep down inside, allowing liquid or slushy water and ice crystals to come spouting out. So there's more or less continually these uh, geysers going off on Enceladus. So that's a really great possible location for the existence of microbes and bacteria. Okay, it's 945, are, are we rolling back there? Yeah? All right, well let's give it, a, give it a go. So thank you all for being here. My name is Alex Filipenko. I've been on the faculty here for 31 years now. So I guess you could say that I love Cal a lot and go Bears. We hope you have a really fun day here at Cal Day and see at least some of what we have to offer on this great campus. In particular, at noon, there will be a Stand Up for Science rally, loosely organized in conjunction with the more nationwide March for Science. That'll be from noon till 1245. There are three speakers. I'll start off at noon, then Ashley Truxell, who's a graduate student in chemistry, and Randy Sheckman, a Nobel laureate in biology. So if you'd like to come to that, that'll be at Memorial Glade, right in front of the Doe Library. And of course, there are many other activities going on as well, and you can find those in your program. So normally, you can't look at the sun very long at, with the naked eye. You shouldn't, okay? Just, I mean, if you glance at it briefly while you're turning the corner in your car, that's okay. You won't go blind, but definitely don't stare at it. It is really, really bright. The disk of our sun is very bright. But occasionally, you get a total solar eclipse when the moon blocks the bright disk, revealing the majestic, glorious, tenuous corona, this low density but very high hot gas, millions of degrees, that's sort of the outer atmosphere of the sun, the beginning of the solar wind blowing away from the sun. These events were to be feared long ago and still are feared in some parts of the world where they don't really know what's going on. Uh, you know, it could be a pretty scary feeling to see the sun for no apparent reason disappearing from your very eyes. And typical explanations were that the gods are angry at us. We did something wrong. They're displeased. Or dragons are eating the sun, you know. So various forms of uh, animal sacrifice would occur and the beating of pots and pans and the chanting and yelling to either appease the gods or scare away the dragon. And you know what? Those techniques worked every time. <laughs> Well, the modern view, of course, is not quite so uh, uh, astonishing, and we don't think that the gods are angry at us and that there are dragons devouring the sun. The modern view is that the moon blocks the disk of the sun, casting a shadow on Earth, and if you're at the location where that shadow falls, you will see the moon exactly blocking the sun's disk, darkening the sky and revealing the outer low brightness, tenuous corona. And this occurs because although the sun is physically about 400 times the diameter of the moon, it's also about 400 times farther away than the moon. And so they appear the same angular size in the sky. And this is just a, a wonderful coincidence that allows the moon to cast a shadow on Earth. This relationship works for other ratios of sizes as well. If I have a tennis ball that's twice as big as a ping pong ball across, and I arrange the relative distances to be two to one, then the ping pong ball exactly covers the tennis ball. All right, two to one ratio in distance, two to one ratio in physical size. They appear the same size in the sky. If the moon is too close, then it more than covers the tennis ball. If it's too far away, then it doesn't quite cover the tennis ball and you get what's called an, an annular eclipse, a ring of fire. But they're the same size to a very good approximation, and so we get this wonderful coincidence of the moon exactly blocking the sun, but not the inner corona. 
uh, we're the only place in the solar system where we have this, this perfect uh, alignment. Some of the moons of Jupiter produce eclipses of the sun, but as seen from the cloud tops of Jupiter, their moons are too big, and so they more than cover the sun's disk. They would cover the inner corona as well. So aliens wanting to vacation in our solar system might well come to Earth in order to see total solar eclipses. So let's look at the stages of a total solar eclipse. At first you have the uneclipsed sun seen here through a yellow filter. The sun actually is a white star. The sunlight is in fact the definition of white light, but here it is filtered. Then the moon gradually starts covering the sun. The process takes about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Just when the last little bits of the disk, the photosphere, are showing, you can get this phenomenon known as Bailey's beads, little bits of sunlight that are shining through valleys on the lunar limb. The, the moon is not perfectly smooth like a billiard ball. It has craters, it has mountains, it has valleys. And so where the mountains block the sunlight, you don't see sunlight. Where they don't block the sunlight, you do. And here you can see, in fact, the rather serrated, you know, uneven surface of the sun and, I'm uh, sorry, of the moon. And if the sun is perfectly lined up, you get all these little places where sunlight is shining through the lunar valleys. Those are the Bailey's beads. The last Bailey's bead, in a sense, gives you what's called the diamond ring effect. Um, it doesn't even have to be a Bailey's bead. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be where there's a valley on the moon, but just the last little bit of the sun to show in photographs is often overexposed, giving you this bright thing here, like a diamond on a ring, the inner corona and a red pinkish region known as the chromosphere begin to show up and you get this ring-like structure. It lasts for a couple of seconds. To me, it's one of the most exciting times of the eclipse because things are changing so rapidly. You can, for the first time, take your filters off. More about that later, safe viewing. And you can enjoy the total eclipse uh, or nearly total eclipse with the naked eye. Uh, once the diamond ring disappears, you can then see this thin pinkish layer called the chromosphere. It's about twice as hot as the photosphere, and it glows because electrons are jumping from higher levels to lower levels of hydrogen and helium, the dominant constituents of the sun. You can also see little tongues of gas sticking out. Here's some more of them. These are called prominences. These are, in a sense, chromospheric temperature gas that's flowing along magnetic field lines that are near but outside the surface of the sun. And so here's a close-up view of a couple of these prominences. You see the inner corona, which is the brightest, the mid corona, which is fainter, and the outer corona. And Photographs just don't capture this because photographs have a limited dynamic range. This photograph is actually quite good. It was done by someone who combined many, many different exposures in order to more clearly reproduce what your eye sees. But your eye has this wonderful dynamic range. It sees the faint things and the bright things simultaneously. And it's just such a moving experience. Yes, I sound a little bit like a nut while waxing eloquent about total solar eclipses, but most people, once they've seen a total eclipse, not a partial eclipse, that doesn't count, a total eclipse, they too, in most cases, become lunatics, and that's a bit of a pun, right, lunatics, but the corona changes from one eclipse to another because it consists of ionized gases moving along magnetic field lines, and the magnetic field lines exterior to the sun change with time. So the corona always looks different. That's one reason to see more than one total eclipse. Plus, there's so little time to view totality, only a minute or two or three, that you never see all the phenomena and absorb them in one eclipse. If you take a very long exposure photograph and combine it with short exposure photographs, you can see both the inner corona and these outer streamers. And you can also see that stars become visible. The sky doesn't become very dark. It's a little bit like twilight, the darkness depending on how far in you are within the band of the shadow and also how many uh, 
bits of dust and stuff are scattering sunlight in the atmosphere, things like that. There's what's called the shadow cone. The shadow of the moon is, is like a cylinder going through Earth. Yes, it's a cone, but through Earth's atmosphere is such a short distance that to a first approximation, it's just a cylinder. Yet it looks like a cone here, this shadow. Okay, here the sun is not fully eclipsed, here it is. And that's just the perspective effect that you get when you have parallel lines viewed along their length toward a vanishing point, like the opposite sides of a railroad track, okay? So that's kind of a neat thing to see. The, the sky becomes darkened all around you. All around you, you see twilight sky colors because just 10 or 20 or 30 miles away, all around you, the sun is not fully eclipsed. It's maybe 99 or 98% eclipsed. Some sunlight is reaching the atmosphere. That sunlight scatters. Some of it reaches you after passing through the air. And just as the setting sun looks some shade of yellow, orange, or red, depending on how much particulate matter there is, so too, all around you, the scattered light that's reaching you appears some shade of yellow, orange, or red. Bright stars come out. I don't spend a lot of time seeing which stars I can detect and which stars I can't. I can do that at night. I spend my time look at, looking at the eclipse, but you will see planets and stars come out. All too quickly, totality ends, again, after just a few minutes, seven minutes maximum, but those eclipses occur only once every few centuries. More typically, it's one to three minutes. You see the chromosphere emerging a little bit of the photosphere leading to the diamond ring effect, and then all the partial stages unfolding in reverse order to what you saw on the way in. And that, again, takes an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half, something like that. Here's the full set of stages lasting a few hours. Most people just party after totality ends. They don't care about the second set of partial phases, but some find it to be a deeply personal and introspective experience. They want to watch the whole thing uninterrupted by partiers and stuff. So respect other people or if you're in a group, depending on how they wish to experience the eclipse. My first total eclipse was on February 26, 1979. I knew almost nothing about eclipses. Eclipse chasing had not become a worldwide phenomenon yet. My advisor at UC Santa Barbara, where I was a senior, said, hey, let's go see the eclipse that's going to be in Oregon. Weather prospects were terrible, but we thought we'd go anyway. We drive out to the Cascade Mountains. It's raining while we're driving from Portland. But then, during the partial stages, this is a bit of overexposed, but here you can see a bite taken out of the sun, the clouds occasionally started clearing away. As the partial stages progressed, more and more clouds cleared away until the first diamond ring and that last cloud cleared away. And it was, oh, just so glorious. These are actually my photographs taken with just a regular camera during that total solar eclipse. I found it to be such a moving experience that when I visited my parents sometimes later, I was literally crying when I described it to them, saying, I've got to go see more of these. My next opportunity wasn't until 12 years later, because I was you know, busy being a student and then um, a postdoc and an assistant professor. I didn't have much time. I didn't have much money. Still don't have much money, but I have more than I did back then. Okay, and so, you know, and most of these things are in distant, remote parts of the world that are expensive to get to. I sometimes think that by giving these talks, I partly ruin it for those of you who are about to see one for the first time. I hope not to do that. I hope to just whet your appetite. But here's a video from an eclipse that shows you some of the sounds as well. I'm not paying people to do this. Totality hasn't even started. It's magnificent. Photographs and even videos really don't give you the full experience, believe me. Shadow cone. Oh, 
shadow cone right there. That's the boundaries of the shadow. Oh, yeah. That, the oh, yeah was me. The guy announcing stuff is Alan Dyer, the photographer. Oh, all right, and then a couple of minutes later, here's near the end. A minute or two after totality ended, this cloud parked itself in front of the sun for the next 10 minutes. We were awfully lucky. This was a long one. This one was three to four minutes. Coming out. Coming out. The diamond ring is spectacularly moving. The lighting is changing so quickly. The shadow races out from under you, from over you. Shadow bands! Shadow bands! I see him, I see him! I see him, I see him! Anyway, it's fantastic. Okay, so what are shadow bands? Well, just before and just after totality, when the sun is just a little sliver in the sky, it twinkles like bright stars. You see them twinkling because the light is going through different layers of density and different humidity in the air and all this kind of stuff, and they move around, and so the light is bent or refracted, sometimes into your eyes and sometimes out of your eyes. That's what leads to twinkling. Well, you can see the twinkling in the case of the sun, but it's so bright that it leaves, in some cases, perceptible variations of brightness and darkness on the ground below you. Those are the shadow bands. A little bit like what you would see if you were in the bottom of a swimming pool looking up toward the sun. There are some places where the sunlight instantaneously is concentrated. There it would be a bright sun. And there are some places where light has been stolen and directed elsewhere. Those are the dark places. And so if you have a, a, a white sheet uh, on the ground, you might detect these shadow bands. But they are very subtle. Okay, now eclipses don't occur every new moon, every time the moon is roughly collinear with the sun, because usually it's not exactly collinear. There's a five degree tilt between the lunar orbit around Earth and Earth's orbit around the sun. So usually the moon is a little bit above or below the sun during new moon, and so you don't get an eclipse. However, a few times per year there's a partial eclipse, and roughly every year and a half, 70 times per century, there's a total eclipse. The path gets swept out on Earth's surface because the moon is orbiting Earth. So this narrow little path, anywhere from 30 miles to about 100 miles wide, depending on which eclipse it is, sweeps out this little locus of points on Earth's surface. Everywhere out here you see a partial eclipse, Interesting oddity, but not super great compared to totality. But where you see the black dot, let's have this start over again, right? Right there, that's where you see the total eclipse, all right? And this is the one that was a year ago, March 2016. Uh, my wife, Noelle, and I were off the coast of Sulawesi right here in Indonesia. But you can see that the path mostly crossed the ocean. That's typically the case, because most of Earth's surface is the ocean. It did pour, pass north of the Hawaiian Islands, so some cruise ships were, were over there. Very small fraction of Earth's surface. Here from a satellite view is a bunch of snapshots sort of pasted together of the moon's shadow on different parts of Earth, spaced every, oh, 45 minutes, half an hour, something like that. This is the July 11th, 1991 eclipse, and there it goes. It actually passed over Hawaii over here, although most places in Hawaii turned out to be cloudy, passed over the tip of Baja, California here, and over Mexico City. I believe the biggest concentration of people ever to have been in the path of totality. Unfortunately, most of the people there were told to stay in doors and not watch the eclipse or watch it on TV. The total part is completely safe. I'll get to that. It's the partial phases you have to be concerned about. The partial phases of that eclipse extended all over the US, maybe not quite in Maine, let's say, because here's New York and there's just a little tiny bite taken out. So, you know, yes, people here got to experience a partial eclipse, and if that's where you are and you can't travel to totality, well, at the very least, do that. It's interesting, but it's nowhere near the feeling that you f have when you are in the path of totality. I was right down there for this one. 
So if you're only in the places where the partial phases occur, over the course of an hour or two, that's what you would see. Now, to view it safely, you need something like shade 14 welder's glass. Even welding supply stores have to sort of special order this because even welders don't typically need such dark glass. But that will shield 99.999% of the optical light and 100% of the ultraviolet and infrared, which could otherwise harm your eyes. I have a bunch of these available at cost after the lecture if you wish to get them. It'll save you a trip to the welding store to special order these things. Through that glass, the sun will appear a greenish hue. That's OK, no big deal. Uh, here, my brother and I are in Mongolia on August 1st, 2008, witnessing a total, well, the partial phases of a total eclipse. And we mounted the glass on a piece of cardboard with a hole in it so that we could more easily hold it and also shield our face, faces from, from the sunlight during, total, during the partial phases. Notice I also, on this one, uh, south of the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa, put the number 13 with a bunch of little holes, and I'll explain that in a minute. But it's also bent around my face to protect my cheeks and stuff. Here's a bunch of people witnessing the 2009 eclipse, FedEx boxes, whatever. You can even punch a hole in a box and just stick it over your head with the filter properly in place. And if you wish, you can be creative and decorate your box. Uh, here, uh, here's a box decorated quite a bit. I got this glasses for protection. Hope Alex will approve. Did you, did you hear about solar eclipse on November 3rd? Yes, I heard about diamond ring. I am so excited. Anyway, or you can get special eclipse viewing glasses mounted on cardboard. Those aren't quite as durable as a piece of glass. I like to stick the glass in my pocket and take it out when I'm standing in line at Disneyland with my kids. I take a look at the sun every once in a while looking for sunspots. People think I'm weird, but that's okay. People think I'm weird anyway. Um, this stuff won't be quite as durable, but it is cheap and quite convenient because it goes right over your ears. And here, a woman in Peru in 1994 is enjoying the eclipse and perhaps something else. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you can stick the filter at the top end of a telescope and get a magnified view of the sun, which will give you a closer up view of sunspots and things like that. Here, Floris de Potter, the son of our former chair of astronomy, Professor Imke de Potter, is looking at the partial phases during the July 1991 eclipse. We went down to Mexico together. Here, too, is a properly filtered telescope. The filter needs to go on top before the mirror or lens has collected a whole bunch of light. If you have the filter down here, the way some manufacturers do it, they stick it in the eyepiece, that's dangerous because a ton of sunlight, well, sunlight isn't measured in tons, but you know what I mean. A bunch of sunlight goes in, gets collected. It could heat up the filter and crack it. And if you're viewing the sun, at that moment, your eye could be, could be fried. Indeed, when looking at the sun, one of my teaching assistants many years ago had pointed the telescope to the sun and had accidentally left the filter, the eyepiece cover, protective cover on the eyepiece before filtering the telescope. And that's what happened to the eyepiece cover, a piece of plastic exposed to the intense sunlight collected by a telescope, so be, be careful. You don't want that to be your eye. The partial phases are dangerous. No more dangerous than the uneclipsed sun, but most of us don't go around staring at the uneclipsed sun. When there's an eclipse, there's a reason to look at it, and that's the danger, especially when it becomes... Sorry. Especially when it becomes a thin crescent, you might think, well, it's getting faint enough to me, for me to look at safely, but it's not safe because that crescent is being concentrated onto a small part of your retina, and that part of your retina could, could get harmed. A safe way of viewing an eclipse without a filter is to produce a pinhole camera that gives you a projection of the luminous sun on a dark viewing screen. So here's a luminous object, a light ray goes through the hole, forms an image there. Light ray from the tail goes through the hole, forms an image there. And all the intermediate light rays go at intermediate angles. So you get an inverted image of your luminous object, just with a hole in a piece of cardboard. Okay, it's a pinhole camera. No lenses, nothing. Simplest camera possible. You just punch a hole, pencil size, is a good uh, 
you know, a, a good compromise between a tiny hole, which will give you a sharp but faint image, and a big hole, which will give you a bright but fuzzy image. So I like a pencil size, plus they're easy to poke with a pencil or a pen. Here I am at an eclipse with my older son's name, Simon, punched into a piece of cardboard, and you can see the projection of the sun, a whole bunch of these little crescent suns on this darkened uh, screen. Basically the shadow cast by my piece of cardboard, and here's the one that I used in March of 2016, my 15th eclipse. You can use a colander, which has um, more nicely defined holes. When you punch holes in a piece of cardboard with a pencil, they have these serrated edges and stuff, so you get a bit of a fuzzy image. With a colander, you have very nice, clean holes, and so you get these very nice, clean images of the sun. They're still not perfectly sharp because the holes have some non-zero width, so there are many angles through which the light rays can enter, and that leads to a little bit of fuzziness, but still, it's really cool. You can even stick your hands together like this, forming pinhole cameras between your fingers they're square or rectangular, that's okay. The image that you're producing is not an image of the square or rectangle, it's an image of the sun. And there they are, little crescent suns formed by the pinhole cameras between your fingers. And in 1991, I was walking along during the partial phases and I noticed this pattern on the ground below me. These are images of the sun produced by spaces, holes between leaves in a tree. Isn't that wonderful? You can use a small telescope or one side of a pair of binoculars and point it toward the sun and end up with um, an image that's magnified and brighter. Just make sure, actually it's, it's this way, sorry, there's the sun up here. Just make sure that neither you nor anyone else looks through the telescope at this point because the unfiltered light is coming through and forming an image, all right? So you get a, a, a brighter, more magnified image, and to just give you an example of that, here is an image of the crescent sun on our shadow, and you can see it's brighter and magnified through a telescope or one monocular of a pair of binoculars. Now, of course, you need to have celestially themed candy while you're experiencing an eclipse, and I have no stock in eclipse gum or orbit gum or anything like that, but if you use a pair of binoculars, and I, I forgot to bring mine, but obviously there's two of them. Don't know why it's called a pair of binoculars. It's a pair of monoculars is what it is. But anyway, if you use binoculars, and project two images of the sun, then you can get something like this, and I, I like to call this the C cups image, you know, and so. Uh, so if the skies are clear, you will be happy, and you can play all kinds of games that Noelle and I like to play. In fact, Noelle came up with this sequence of a Pac-Man sun eating these little candies, okay? You can give it an eye if you want. You need to use the pinhole camera or a filter Anytime you're looking at the uneclipsed or partially eclipsed sun, with the exception of the last couple of seconds before totality and the first couple of seconds after totality. That's when it's safe to remove the filter and for a couple of seconds look at that last little bit of uneclipsed sun because it only lasts a couple of seconds and there's only a little bit of it. Don't use a telescope or binoculars at that time because you will gather too much sunlight and it could harm your eyes. But with the unaided eye, no filters, diamond ring effect, truly an enormously moving experience. The shadows coming over you, the skies are darkening quickly, the temperatures have been going down, people are yelling and screaming, animals are behaving weirdly. It's just magnificent. Again, I know I sound a little bit like a lunatic, but most people who actually go and experience one then feel at least some of what I feel, and some of them are even more over the top than I am. Um, don't know why my computer just did that, but let's just see if it, let's just see if it comes back. Ha, did it come back? Yes, it did, very good. So, diamond ring, you can view without a filter, but no telescope. Then a couple of seconds later, when totality starts, naked eye, binoculars, telescope, all of those are okay. No filters. If you're staring through a filter, you will wonder what all the excitement is all about. You will have missed totality. You might as well not have gone, all right, if your goal was to view a total eclipse and not a partial eclipse.
all right? So the corona is quite faint. No danger whatsoever to your eyes. There's no weird, dangerous rays coming from it. It's very hot gas, but there's very little of it. Indeed, here's a fun fact to know and tell at the next cocktail party, thus uh, ensuring that you'll never again be invited to a cocktail party. You can tell someone that if you were to immerse yourself in the corona and block the sun, though you're in this gas that has a temperature of a couple of million degrees, you would freeze to death because your body would be losing energy to the outside world faster than it's gaining energy from the occasional high speed particle hitting you. So you would actually freeze while in this two million degree corona. And that's because the density of the gas is very, very low. Don't try this at home, but anyway, it's just a fun thing. Okay, so here's a bunch of these paths during the current quarter century. This is all of the total eclipses in the current 25 years from 2001 to 2025. They're rare, all right? On average, one total eclipse will visit you roughly every 380 years if you don't make an effort to go it. So you should go see the eclipse. This is also a great excuse to travel to distant lands if you have the time and the means and the desire to travel to various places over Earth's surface and there's no particular order in which you need to do it, you might as well choose your vacation locations to be at the location and at the time of the total solar eclipse because then you'll have your one or two week long vacation plus the total solar eclipse. Great, you know? Special things can happen. Here's one, April 8th, 2005. Actually went close to the Galapagos Islands. It was a short one, even at its maximum, it was only 42 seconds long, shorter at the ends, longest in the middle. We were on a ship near Pitcairn Island of Mutiny on the Bounty fame. Everyone was having a good time on board. Skies were reasonably clear, people were happy. But as the morning progressed, more and more convectively driven clouds appeared because the atmosphere is heating up and this kind of thing happens in the tropics and elsewhere as well. So we were not happy at this point, <laughs> all right? But then, just before totality, a cloud that had covered the sun for two whole minutes moved out of the way and we from our location experienced 30 seconds of totality. And it was just so wonderful. Sometimes the clouds can enhance the experience because you don't know that you're gonna see it and nothing is certain and you think you won't see it and so it just, ah, it's just fantastic. And here's a wide angle shot taken by Alan Dyer showing this uneclipsed or this eclipsed sun and here's the cloud that had covered it for two two continuous minutes and that cloud is opaque. So we didn't see anything during that time. That little dot there is Venus, by the way. It was a wonderful eclipse. We saw the inner corona well. We saw the chromosphere all around the silhouette of the moon because in this case, the moon was almost perfectly the same size as the sun. That leads to a very short eclipse, but uh, you can see the chromosphere all the way around. If the moon is a little bit closer to you than the two to one ratio, then that leads to a longer eclipse, as I said, up to six or seven minutes in length because it takes longer for the slightly bigger moon to fully traverse the um, disk of the sun but never more than about seven minutes. Anyway, this was a shorty, 30 seconds, but it was one of the most memorable bubble of the 15 that I've ever seen. In part, because we were on a wonderful ship where everyone was partying afterwards and having Mai Tais. Everyone was really, really happy. 20 minutes later, it started raining, but everyone was still really happy. Here's a break in the clouds where, uh, well, you know, we got the sunlight, but uh, right above us, there was uh, rain. And so anyway, we were particularly happy at that eclipse because I actually got engaged to know well at that eclipse. And so we were thinking of making a t-shirt. I got engaged at the South Pacific total solar eclipse and all I got was this diamond ring, <laughs> this particular one. Well, that's a little bit unfair because I gave my fiance two diamond rings, okay? 
by the way, this just shows you how close a call it was. This is the first diamond ring, and from that part of the ship, part of the cloud, the outer part of the cloud was still covering the sun, but in a relatively transparent part. But anyway, I gave her two diamond rings, and I must have told this story a number of times, and someone in the crowd a few months ago left anonymously at my office a t-shirt, got engaged during a solar eclipse. Well, it wasn't exactly during the eclipse. I didn't want to try that trick because I might have been beat over the head with a pot or a pan. Why are you ruining the experience of a total eclipse by proposing? I actually did it during a lecture kind of like this before the eclipse. Anyway, you look at this map of the current quarter century of eclipses and you say, whoa, these are all distant and all that, but not all of them are distant. Look at that one right there. It is marked 2017, August 21st. Look at that. Here's the animation of the shadow all over North America, partial eclipse. If that's the only thing you can see, you can't travel to the path of totality, well, go and see it. It's an interesting curiosity. But if you can travel to the path of totality, please do so. This is one of the more accessible eclipses. There it goes. It's the all-American total solar eclipse. Nowhere does it cross land except the United States, the continental US. We own this eclipse, okay? Look at that. First time in 38 years that it hits the continental US. First time in a century that it's coast to coast. Okay, here's the path. You can use your fav favorite search engine, Google or whatever. Path of totality, total solar eclipse, August 2017. That'll land you on interactive websites where you can zoom in on various places along this gray path. You have to be within the gray path. Eugene and Portland are close, but no cigar, 98% eclipsed or whatever, yes, that's better than 10 or 20 percent, but the difference between 98 or 99 percent and 100 percent is, you know, literally like day and night, but even more so because day and night are a kind of common experience. You're used to that, but a total solar eclipse is really very, very different. So within that gray path, you see all of the phases, and it lasts a couple of hours, including about two minutes of totality, depending on exactly where you are. If you're outside that path, this is what you'll see, some amount of partially eclipsed sun. And again, if you can't travel to the path of totality and be there on August 21st, at at least make an effort to see the partial phases. But if you can, go to this narrow path. Um, the duration increases from the edges to the center somewhere in Kentucky. It's the maximum, two minutes and 44 seconds, and then it decreases here. In Oregon, it's roughly two minutes. That's if you're at the center line. The duration is shorter if you're closer to the edges. I'll say more about that later. So the first priority is to be win within that gray path. Second priority is to be where the weather is good, right? I mean, if it's totally cloudy, you'll still experience it to some degree. There will be the darkness that envelops you, but you won't see the diamond ring, you won't see the corona. So weather is obviously very important. To a good first approximation, the odds of good weather decrease as you go from west to east in the United States, okay? Blue is likely to be clear skies, 10, 20, 30% cloud cover. Yellow or orange, likely to be cloudier skies, 50, 60, 70, 75% clouds, all right? Here's the morning view, 7 a.m., afternoon view, 2 p.m. You know, there are variations. There are good spots in Nebraska and Wyoming and other places, but to a good first approximation, Oregon, Idaho, those places are better than South Carolina, Kentucky, places like that. And in fact, on the websites, and I'll give you some websites at the end, but as I say, you can Google them and find them yourself. Here's the mean fractional cloud amount as a function of where you are in the US. Here, here's the Pacific Ocean. There's no need to be on a cruise ship in this case. You have the stability of land. You can hear and watch the animals behaving weirdly. So here in Oregon, parts of Idaho, parts of Wyoming, uh, you have the least amount of clouds. As you go toward the eastern US, there are some variations, but cloud conditions tend to get um, more prevalent. So that's, uh, that's the path. Be somewhere along the path. 
Now, I said that along the center line itself, you have the longest duration of totality. So here's the relative duration from zero, no total eclipse to one, the maximum possible duration. The duration increases from the edges to the center over Kentucky and down to the edges. But then within the path, perpendicular to the center line, as a function of the number of miles or the fractional distance to the edge, here's the duration of totality. Okay, it's longest right on what's called the center line. Let's go back to uh, this little thing. It's that blue line there. That's the center line. The red lines are the outer edges. So now we're going to be looking at the duration as a function of distance, fractional distance from the center line to the edges. That's what we're showing here. Okay, so you see that you can move considerably away from the center line and still have most of the duration. It's a myth that you have to be right on the center line. And a lot of people head toward the center line, but you might be stuck in gigantic crowds if you insist on going to the center line. It's actually better to be, in some cases, you know, away from people if the center line is in a city that's easily accessible and likely to be crowded. So even 60, 70 percent away from the center line to the edge, you still get roughly 70 percent of the duration. And then as you get closer to the edge, very close to the edge, the duration takes a nosedive. OK, I'll answer questions at the end. So to give you an example of this, suppose you have relatives in Missouri, or maybe you're even from Missouri, and you decide you want to observe from St. Clair, Missouri. Xavier GBA's wonderful interactive Google Map website tells you the duration and everything here. It's going to be two minutes and 40 seconds, I think it says. It's clearer actually up there than on my screen. But here's the oval that the, sun's, that the moon's shadow will be making at that moment. Let's say you don't want to go to St. Clair because you think St. Clair will be really crowded. Let's suppose you go to Sullivan, Missouri. All right, so that's this distance away from center line. Two minutes and 23, sorry, 33 seconds. You've only lost seven seconds. And, and above 20 or 30 seconds, it hardly matters. I mean, most of the memories will be indelibly etched into your brain anyway. Yes, a longer duration is nice, but it is not the primary objective. The primary objective is to be somewhere in the path of a totality where there are clear skies. The duration, you know, don't all everyone head to Lexington, Kentucky, or wherever the maximum is. Suppose you go to Cuba, Cuba, Missouri, not Cuba, you know, the country. So you're way off the path. You're about, I don't know, 70% perhaps away from the center line is what I meant to say. You're within the path. Well, there the duration is one minute and, you know, 51 seconds. Still really good, you know, quite long. If you go... Slightly north of St. James, Missouri, here's St. James, you go to slightly north, you're just a, you're almost at the edge, you're quite far from the center line, you still have roughly half a minute of totality. Now that's getting a, a bit short, I would say, given that you could have two or two and a half minutes and you happen to be in that part of the world anyway, might as well head to a little bit closer to the center line, but if you're stuck there, you'll still have half a minute of totality, not the end of the world. Like I said, one of my most memorable eclipses because of the engagement and because of just the, the sheer uh, adrenaline flowing when this giant cloud was covering the sun, totality was only 30 seconds long. We knew it would be only 30 seconds long. So just be somewhere within the path. Some veteran eclipse chasers actually say that it's better to be near the edge, slightly north of St. James, Missouri, for example. And their reason is the following. Edge phenomena, which I'll define in a minute, increase very dramatically as you get to about 95% of the way fractionally from center line to the very edge. And although the duration of totality is short there, they claim that the edge effects are so magnificent and last so much longer that that makes it worthwhile. Well, it's hard to sell tour groups when you're going to the edge because, you know, everyone says, oh, totality, we, wanna, we want time to soak it in. And especially if this is your first, second, or even third eclipse, I would say go to, you know, where it's going to be pretty long duration. Soak it in. But the edge effects that some veterans you know, wax eloquent about are, for example, the Bailey's beads, 
which last longer, and there are more of them. If you're near the edge, I'll show you why in a minute. And the diamond ring. Both of them last longer if you're near the edge. And here's the reason. If you're viewing near the edge, the moon is a little bit above the sun, just barely going to cover it at the bottom part, more easily covering it at the top part. So here you go, it's covering it more and more and more. And right there, with all the mountains and valleys in the moon, you'll get a whole bunch of Bailey's beads. And then the moon will skirt across the bottom of the sun, and it's hidden here because it's totality, but on the way from this image or you know, rec rec recreation to this one, you'll get a longer duration diamond ring. Because it's not like you've got some straight edge covering the sun and you know, more and more and more covered, and there's the diamond ring, and then boom, it's gone. With the curved edge, that phase during which only a tiny part of the sun is visible lasts longer. That's the diamond ring effect. And then you get all these Bailey's beads, all right? But it doesn't last long, but you get more Bailey's beads and a longer duration diamond ring, and to many of us, the diamond ring is actually in some ways better than a long, you know, prolonged view of the corona. To each their own. If this is your, if this is your first eclipse, or even the first of se or even the third or fourth, I wouldn't go to the edge. On the other hand, I must admit, I've never been at the edge out of 15 of these things, so maybe I don't know what I'm missing. On the other hand, the 30-second long eclipse in 2005 was like being near the edge of a more longer eclipse, and I do remember that eclipse. It was a wonderful eclipse. There were Bailey's beads. The diamond ring lasted a long time, but I remember it for the whole phenomenon, including the beautiful corona, and I just need time to absorb everything. Maybe one of these days I'll go to the edge and then my tone will change. Go to the edge, everyone. So if you find yourself in St. James, Missouri, fine. In, you know, enjoy a 30 second long eclipse, but you'll have longer edge phenomena. All right. Um, viewing near the center line, meant to show this by comparison. All right, it's being covered, covered more. In the moment between those two uh, stages, you get a very short diamond ring. For just a very short amount of time is the last little bit of the sun showing. And I just, I couldn't show that because the pixelation on my screen wouldn't allow that, that, um, that stage. And then for a while, I'm clicking, the sun is covered, a couple of minutes. And then you get a short diamond ring. Here it is. It's just beginning to come out, I think, right there. Get a short diamond ring, a short interval of Bailey's beads, and then you party hard or witness the partial phases. So, as I said, if it, especially if it's your first eclipse, go for duration and good weather, not edge effects. And remember, you don't have to be super close to the center line. But you must be within the path of totality, otherwise you'll miss it. And again, being close may be good enough in horseshoes, but not if your desire is to witness totality. There's no in-between. It's like being pregnant and not pregnant. There, there's no in-between, okay? You got to be within that gray path. And you can zoom in on these things online. Here's Xavier Jubier's website. But again, you can, you'll find it. The top hit, I think, is his website. If you just Google um, Total Solar Eclipse Path, August 2017. Here's another very good one, Eclipsophile, is a fe fellow named Fred Espinak, who's seen several dozen of these things. He calls himself the Eclipsophile. I'm an addict. And then there's other sites as well. In fact, here's Fred Espinak's overview page. And here are pages that will tell you about, the, about climate patterns. Of course, there's a big difference between climate, which is long term, and weather, which is what's happening the day of the eclipse. And if you have the opportunity, you can increase your chances by in, including the possibility of some mobility. If you're not with a big group, you're just on your own with your family, and there's a very cloudy skies where you happen to be and you've got the weather maps open on your computer or your smartphone, you might want to zip over to where it's clear. 
on, on roads, you have limited two-dimensional mobility. On a ship, actually, you can aim for holes quite easily. And so on a ship, you improve your odds quite a bit, especially in places where, like the South Pacific where there are popcorn you know, clouds that have big spaces in between. But anyway, lots of good websites. I think those who wanted to have taken a photograph of it. So just, you know, enjoy and go bears. <laughs> enjoy the rest of Cal Day. If you want a piece of shade 14 glass, I have them up here at cost, basically. Often at these talks, people ask me, do I have anything of mine, recorded lectures, a book, or whatever th that they can purchase? And so, in fact, I did bring a bunch of my video lectures, a course on black holes, a course on sky watching, you know, sunsets, green flash, nighttime phenomena, daytime phenomena, auroras, and then a, a giant course on astronomy, and also my introductory astronomy textbook, and I'll take cash, checks, or even IOUs, because I'm a trusting fellow. But, but basically, Enjoy. And I think we have time for questions now. Thank you. Okay. So thanks very much. I, I think you had your hand up, but we have we have until eleven o'clock in this room. So So you've emphasized the ooh and ah factor? The ooh and ah factor, yes. Is there a sort of crowdsourced science game to be played here? For example, oh, yeah. actually have a multi hour yes. or two hour. A movie of what's going on. Right. The question is, is there a science component? For example, is there a two hour long movie of the path of people photographing, you know, the corona uh, over the path of the US? Indeed, there is the Eclipse mega movie being produced uh, in cooperation with Google, making and science branch of Google. And people here at the Space Sciences Lab, I'm involved as well. Uh, I think you can use your favorite search engine to look for it or email me and I'll send you the contacts. We want a thousand skilled observers who are trained uh, to take the photographs in the same way across the US. And we only have, I think, a couple of hundred volunteers right now. So I or this website, Eclipse Mega Movie, will direct you to the people who to contact if you want to find out more and participate in this. That leads me to just one comment, especially if it's your first eclipse. People ask, you know, should you spend a lot of time taking photographs? No, don't spend a lot of time taking photographs. Take maybe one photograph that will jar your memory when you're 97 years old or something like that and wondering what the hell you were doing in, you know, southern Idaho or something on August 21st. But there will be lots of other people that will have much better photographs than you. I speak from experience. I spent one eclipse, the 1994 eclipse in Peru. I spent the two minutes fiddling with my camera and not just being immersed in the eclipse and enjoying it by eye. So take a quick photo of yourself in the cloud. Well, not yourself during the totality. That's really vague. But anyway, um, and will be distracting to others and to yourself, even if you take a selfie. But you know, during the partial phases, take one one photograph of totality just to jar your memory later on. But rely on the many beautiful photographs that will be taken by by others. Okay, and, and there are other science things like Jay Pasikoff, the co-author on my introductory textbook. He studies eclipses from a scientific perspective. I only enjoy them as you know, an amateur astronomer. I'm a professional astronomer, but during an eclipse, I don't take any measurements. I'm just there for the wow factor. But he measures structure in the inner corona and things like that that you can't get from satellites like the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, SOHO, that have an occulting disk that blocks 24-7 not only the disk, but the inner corona as well, because if they didn't do that, diffraction effects would mess up, up their photographs. So there still is some scientific value in studying the inner corona. Uh, back there, and then I see a bunch of other questions. This is great. Yes. For, and I'll repeat the questions, by the way. First solar eclipse. First solar eclipse. Would you recommend something like Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is up high? Jackson Hole, Wyoming, yeah. Or like Casper, Casper, Wyoming. So Jackson Hole is one of the most scenic places in the, in the U.S. Wonderful place from which to observe uh, the eclipse. It's, it's good. It's probably going to have good weather. I do worry a little bit about um, the humid mountain air cooling down and then condensing into fog. So as the sun gets covered, the air cools down. That's one of the things you feel as the temperature is going down. Humid air can then start condensing into fog. However, 
partially if not fully negating the cooling of the air produced by the blocking progressively more and more of the sun, the sun will be getting higher and higher in the sky. So that'll lead to more heating. So maybe in Jackson Hole, those two effects will cancel out and there will be very little temperature change, in which case there's very little chance of fog forming. But I just don't know exactly what'll happen. Casper, Wyoming, you can see right here. Very good place. Uh, Jackson Hole, you can see the cloudiness is more likely than in Casper. What time of day? So in Oregon, 10:20 in the morning, plus or minus, depending on exactly where you are in Oregon, the shadow races across land at one to 2,000 miles per hour, depending on where you are in the eclipse path. So it takes, I think, an hour and a half or two hours at most, maybe an hour and a half, to cross the U.S., but you're also going into later time zones. So it's roughly 10:20 out here in Oregon. It's roughly 2:30, I think in South Carolina. In Wyoming, uh, I don't remember exactly what time, but these websites will tell you when. Many of the websites will give you the time in what's called universal time. That's time in Greenwich, England. Subtract seven hours for the Pacific coast, for the Pacific time zone. Six hours from the mountain time zone five hours from the central time zone, four hours from the eastern time zone. You gotta be not only in the right place, but at the right time. And I kid you not, there were people in Mexico in 91 who were sitting around in a bar and you know, enjoying some drinks and they forgot to change their clocks, their watches, and they missed totality. Don't miss totality. If you don't see the partial phases starting roughly when you thought they should, and that's like 9 o'clock a.m. in Oregon, for example, then you know, either you missed it or you know, it's coming up in a while. Yes, right there. So, so to answer your question, I don't know, but there are a lot of good places, and especially if you have mobility, you might be able to choose at the last minute. If you're, if you've, if you're in a car with your family, and the day before you can tell that Jackson is gonna have a giant cloud over it, drive to Casper. Or if Casper is gonna have a giant cloud, drive somewhere else. The second part of my question is, if I'm up high, will, will the uh, twilight make it worse? Or should if you're up high, the, you know, in general things are, are better because you actually have a better chance of seeing the approaching shadow coming in from the west. Now, there are many phenomena I didn't have time to explain, but it's often better also because you're above haze and stuff. And in fact, the sky will be darker. I've seen one from an airplane in March of 2015 because most of the path went over the cloudy North Atlantic. But in an airplane, we were above the clouds. The sky was considerably darker because we were way up there, 40,000 feet. On the other hand, we didn't feel changing temperatures and we weren't surrounded by a crowd of people in a circular pattern. There was a long tube of people, so it was hard to gauge the excitement of the people at the back end of the plane. So there are pros and cons to just about any scenario you might imagine. On a cruise ship, you can aim for the holes in a two-dimensional way, but you don't have the stability of solid land if you're a really good photographer and need that stability. You kind of have to wait for the extrema of the boat going back and forth because the motion is minimized right at the turnaround point. So, I mean, there are many factors and just try to see it regardless of, of anything. Yes, and then I'll get to Like you, I got to see the eclipse in 1979. 1979. In the middle of winter, yeah. the entire Pacific Northwest was covered with storms. Yes. The radio put out the alert that was clearing over Goldendale, Washington. There you go. Goldendale, Washington was just a few miles north of where I was, the Dalles. And uh, I was at the full-scale replica of Stonehenge at Maryhill. Oh my goodness. With a couple thousand druids. Uh, uh, the 1999 eclipse, August 11th, right? <laughs> this is 79. Oh, 79, if you were at Stonehenge, yeah. Well, that's in England. Replica. Oh, the replica of Stonehenge. Oh, okay. Full-size yeah. replica. Yeah, full-size replica. Okay. To the Columbia River. Yeah, Col okay, great, yeah. I won't go on. The story is amazing. The most amazing thing of all was during absolute totality, looking down at the Columbia River where there's a secondary road. Yes. And a row of headlights driving along, unable, un unknowing, 
I'm willing to pull over for the chance of a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, just, hey, it got dark, turn on the lights, we're driving to Portland. Right, I hope people heard that, but my experience was at three in the morning, we were driving from Portland, it was pouring rain, there's a bunch of people driving from Portland, there's the occasional car or trucker, you know, going westbound, wondering what the hell is going on? You know, did a bomb just explode in Portland? Is that why everyone's being evacuated away? But they're like totally clueless, or if they're not clueless and they know what's going on and they didn't stop, all I can say is, gosh, what will it take to turn you on to science? Yeah, right back there. Great. Lots of good questions. Okay. Yeah, yes. And then, uh, but there first. Yes. I have a location question. We have the ability to go to either the center line near Idaho Falls or the Salem. Based on this graph. Yeah. Uh, Idaho Falls or Salem. Yeah, just north of Salem. So right. if all other things being equal, no predicted storm, yeah. where would you go? Yeah, so where would I go? So. So here's my concern with Salem. I think it's a pretty good place. It's inland, but there still is the possibility, though smaller, of coastal fog forming, right? There's Salem. It's pretty inland. Uh, here's one of these weather maps. Here's Salem, right? Salem, pretty good, uh, versus Idaho Falls, is that what you said? Right. Looks about the same to me. And again, probably, although I'm not sure, no. Jay Anderson uses satellite data spanning decades to produce this chart. What he hasn't taken into account is, say, the cooling of coastal air leading to the formation of fog. Well, for Salem, that's perhaps not that much of a concern because Salem is inland. And moreover, there might not be that much cooling because as the partial phases progress and more of the sun is covered, the sun is rising higher in the sky and that's a counterbalancing effect. So Salem is probably just fine. Idaho Falls, I'm not as familiar with the topography there and stuff, but Idaho in general looks quite good. Uh, I'd probably pick Idaho, but uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, you know, uh, in part I'm being noncommittal here because I don't want you blaming me for uh, not seeing it. There was a question right there, yes, and then. Uh, I have a kind of problem with visualizing between a 0.5 uh, for crowd and a 0.5. Oh, a problem visualizing between 40%. Yeah, how different is that? Well, that's a great question because this is just an average. It doesn't tell you whether these are 40% chance of completely overcast skies or popcorn clouds covering 40% of the sky, in which case if you're lucky, as we were in Goldendale and also where I was near the Dalles, Oregon. Yeah, you know, and weather, the day of is different from climate, right? So what can I tell you? All I can tell you is I've been to 15 and never have I been completely clouded out because I choose wisely and try to have some mobility. Now, my wife and I have organized a big group of Cal alumni and friends and family. There's going to be 400 of us. We're not going to have much room for mobility. Uh, so we're probably just going to stick with our chosen site and hope for the best. Yeah, you're going to Salem. It's probably fine. Yes. People should know that every single motel room, campsite, and Airbnb room along the path of totality is booked and was booked like a year ago. Great, great point. However, there may be, there is a, like an eclipse viewing party in Madras, Oregon, yeah. which is one of the best possible places, and there might be some high-priced campsites there available. That's right. I've heard that every hotel room along the path of totality has been sold out for a year. There is one camp, and I heard this the other day as well, in Madras, which I actually think will be a mad house, right. because there might be a million people in this town of, whatever, 30,000 or something, because a lot of the newspaper articles, the, the writers have looked at Jay Anderson's map, and it doesn't take a super genius to see that Madras is one of the best places, along with Mitchell, uh, Oregon, and the John Day dinosaur fossil place, and also Casper, Wyoming, and places like that. But anyway, that's easily reachable by Highway 97. Oh, but let me add that the state of Oregon has some very useful uh, information about all this, and they say that every 
road in the area will be completely jammed up. Yeah, State of Oregon, ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, does warn that roads will be jammed because it's easy drive up I-5 from California and there are millions of people living in California. So if you plan to go the day of, leave really, really early. There's going to be a lot of traffic more likely than not. Now, there's not going to be 300 million people in, you know, in Madras because the people over here are just going to stay where they are, most likely. But there are going to be Asians and Europeans and others coming in for tours. So it could be quite crowded. Yes, right there. I have to ask you how your parents reacted after your first eclipse when you came home. Yeah, how my parents reacted. They were like, you know, ha, you know, has college turned you nutty or something like that? Fortunately, they didn't say that. They come from sort of a very educated and science-related background. My father was a mathematician, um, so was my brother. But I said, you know, mom and dad, I'll take you someday. And I took them for the July 11th, 1991 eclipse. My family was with me, and they then saw what it is I meant. Yes, they saw how moving an experience it was. I think we have a couple of more minutes before the next speaker, speaker comes in. Yes right back there. I just wondered at what point do you decide not to travel and just park yourself? So at what point do you decide not to tra continue traveling and just park yourself? <laughs> If you're 15 minutes before totality and you're within the path and the road is a parking lot, pull over if you even can, or maybe it's a parking lot because people ahead of you have simply stopped and get out of the car. I have a friend who was in Europe in August of 99. They were madly driving through France, just trying to find a hole in the clouds. Most of Western Europe was clouded out. I was in Turkey uh, in beautiful skies, but as you went west in Europe, progressively worse conditions, a little bit like what we're seeing here in the US. And minutes before totality, they, they found a clearing. They parked on the side of the road, hopped out of the car, observed totality and the diamond ring effects, and then shortly thereafter, it became cloudy again. So, you know, just get out minutes before. Don't keep driving because you might not have a chance to get out minutes before if you're, if you're driving, right? Uh, you might be at a place where you simply cannot pull over safely or something like that. But again, it's a bit of a judgment call. You know, part of it is the adventure. It's called eclipse chasing for a reason. In 94, we were in Peru. The woman that was among those rocks with the glasses on, okay? We were in tents at a golf course staying overnight and we were gonna drive to the eclipse path in the morning, early in the morning. We then started worrying, what if the Peruvian government or someone blocks the road in the morning and demands $50,000 to head up to the path of totality? We weren't willing to take that chance. We're sleeping in sleeping bags anyway on a, in tents in a golf course, nice soft grass. But, you know, we said, tough it up, grabbed our sleeping bags, headed up to that path of totality the night before, cleared away the rocks and laid out our sleeping bags and slept at the location of totality. I don't know that anyone blocked the roads and demanded $50,000, but it was a possibility. So if you can, I would say get to the location at least the night before and sleep there if you can. That'll improve your odds. Uh, but if you can't, and you're driving in from Eureka, California, because that's the only place you could find a hotel, well, you'll probably find one in Medford or some places in Oregon, or maybe Boise has some hotels, rooms. Boise is close, but like Portland and, and Eugene, not close enough. You go northeast along whatever road it is from Boise, and you'll get to the path of totality in an hour. I'm sure there are some hotels in Boise that are still available. So if you find yourself calling hotels in the path of totality, you know, and you don't find a room, just get one off of the path and then drive super early. By the way, there's also been articles about hotels that got booked years ago when people knowing about the eclipse called in and the hotel owners didn't know that anything special was going on. So they said, well, this is a bit unusual. Do you really want to book a hotel room this far in advance? And the people said, yeah, you know, we're having a family reunion or something. <laughs> and so the hotels said, okay, well, we'll let you book it up. Unlike the airlines, like our 320, 330 days before the flight is the earliest you can book an airline flight. And recently, you know, they've been reading about all the hype and the hype is going to exponentiate as we get closer to the day of totality. They've been canceling people's reservations and reselling the rooms at five, seven times their normal price. People are understandably quite 
annoyed by this. There may well even be lawsuits, but according to this one article, some of these hotel owners think that even after they settle or whatever with the people they screwed, they will still end up with a healthy profit. <laughs> Forget about the morals of canceling people's hotel reservations. So if you made them years ago, check with the hotel owners to see that you still have a room. They may have sold it without even telling you, you know. One more question, and I see, think I see other people coming in for the next uh, presentation. Uh, how about someone who hasn't? Yes, back there. There's a big problem with this chart here because it, it shows morning and afternoon, but what really matters is what is the cloud cover going to be like at the time? Well, what is the cloud cover going to be like at the time, you know? <laughs> this is totally statistical. Look, look, if you believe the weather ten, reports 10 days even ahead, seven days they're becoming pretty good. You know, meteorology is becoming a more advanced thing, but it's still the atmosphere a very chaotic system and any particular place could be cloudy. And cloudy places, I mean, we were given snowflake chance in hell odds of seeing the eclipse in southern Washington and northern Oregon on February 26, 1979. But to those of us who went where at the last minute the weather, the meteorologist said, if there's going to be a clearing, here's where it's going to be, at the crest or just east of the crest of the Cascade Mountains. Go there. That's where we and thousands of people went and most of us saw the eclipse against all odds. All right, thank you very much for your attention, and I've got stuff up here if you'd like.